This is the first video for section 2.1 on controversial elections. In this video, I'll give a brief introduction to the topics that we're going to be talking about in this unit. So the big question that we're going to be asking a lot over the next several sections is, how do we choose the winner of an election? You might think it's pretty simple, but it's actually harder than you might think. There are many examples in history where the results of an election were deemed to be unfair. And so we're going to talk a lot about fairness and what that really means in the context of this mathematics course. So one way that elections can be unfair is when people are prevented from voting. Uh, this can be through voter suppression or poll taxes or gerrymandering, and those are all unfair things, but those are not going to be the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about in this course. In this course, we're going to be assuming that none of these things are actually occurring, even though in the real world we do have to deal with these issues, and they are issues that should be examined in a societal sense. So if everybody who wants to vote gets a vote and every vote gets counted, can the results still be, in some sense, unfair? Well, in this lecture, we're going to look at some controversial elections from recent years that could arguably be said to be unfair. So one example is the 2020 Democratic primary. If you look here, here's just a sample, actually, this isn't all of them, of the candidates who ran for the nomination for, the, uh, for president from the Democratic Party. And one of the reasons why primary elections can be problematic or, or controversial is because there are so many candidates, someone's favorite candidate or someone who you might personally think is the best candidate doesn't ever really get a shot because they're competing against so many other people and they never get to the level of support to eventually end up winning the nomination. So one of the purposes of primary elections is to narrow such a wide field down to a single nominee. But uh, one, and there are many criticisms of the primary process, but one criticism is that some states don't get to vote until later in the process. For example, here in Pennsylvania, our primary was not until June 2nd, but the Iowa caucus was the first primary, and that was on February 3rd. So that's a long period of time where by the time June rolls around and Pennsylvania voters get to vote, the candidate they might have wanted to vote for was no longer even in the race. So they were unable to make a meaningful vote for their preferred candidate. Let's go back in time a little bit. If we look at the 2000 presidential election, this was controversial for a different reason. In the eventual election, it was Al Gore for the Democratic Party versus George W. Bush for the Republican Party. But there were also two other candidates. There was Ralph Nader, who was the candidate for the Green Party, and Pat Buchanan, who was the candidate for the Reform Party. And if we just look at the popular vote, now the Electoral College is a whole different issue that we are going to talk about eventually. But if we just look at the popular vote, we see that Al Gore got 48.4% of the vote and George Bush got 47.9% of the vote. So both of these candidates received less than half of the vote, and the additional, almost a little over 3% of the vote, went to these minor party candidates. So the argument often gets made that these minor party votes should have or could have been assigned to some of those other candidates, which could have changed the outcome of the election. So one of the reasons why 2000 was such a controversial election is that Al Gore, as we just saw, won the popular vote, got more votes than anybody else, but George W. Bush won the Electoral College. If we just focus on Florida, the result of the state of Florida was actually in dispute for several weeks. There were recounts and the, uh, it was a big controversy where nobody knew who had won the election. And eventually uh, the Supreme Court stepped in and ordered to stop to the recounts. And eventually the final margin, the official margin of victory for George W. Bush in Florida was 537 votes, only 537 out of a total of 5.8 million votes that were cast in Florida. So again, you look at those minor party candidates and you say, well, if only 538 people who had voted for uh, Pat Buchanan or George, uh, Ralph Nader had voted for Al Gore, that would have swung the election and the entire uh, course of the last 20 plus years of history would have been a little bit different. Rewinding time even further, if we go back to 1912, the 1912 presidential election, well, 2000 wasn't the first time that there had been a third party spoiler. And we're going to again see this word spoiler again as we keep talking about this stuff. Um, but in 1912, after Theodore Roosevelt failed to get the Republican Party nomination, he decided to run as a third party candidate. And so what happened was the people who wanted to vote for a Republican, they split. And so some of them voted for William Howard Taft, who was the official Republican Party nominee. And some of them voted for Theodore Roosevelt because they still liked him as a candidate. And so the Republicans split between these two candidates and eventually Woodrow Wilson ended up being the winner. And that's an example of what we call the spoiler effect, which, like I said, we're going to talk more about as we go forward in this section. 
So this idea of spoilers is this idea that if people who had, and, and again, we can argue the semantics here, but people who had wasted their vote is, is how some people say it. I'm not necessarily endorsing that language, but people who had, quote, wasted their vote on a minor party candidate who didn't have a chance to win, if instead those voters had voted for major party candidates, then the outcome of the election could have switched. And th I, this happened again in 2016, where a lot of voters who didn't like Hillary Clinton instead voted for Jill Stein, Green Party, or Gary Johnson for the Libertarian Party. And Hillary Clinton won, uh, lost several states by very thin margins. And again, the argument gets made that if some of those people who had voted for those minor party candidates had instead voted for Hillary Clinton, then Clinton would have won the Electoral College and won the 2016 election. One more example here before we wrap things up. In 1998, there was a, uh, an election for the governor of Minnesota, and there were three main party candidates, a Republican, a Democrat, and Jesse Ventura, who ran for the Reform Party. And if you look at the results of the vote here, this is very unusual, where the person who won the election, Jesse Ventura, only got 37% of the vote. That's very, very low for the winner of, of a race, even though there were three candidates here. And one of the reasons why this was such an, uh, a controversial outcome is that Jesse Ventura was actually a former professional wrestler. Here's a picture of him in his wrestling days uh, in a, a fun getup there. And so a lot of people were very upset by this outcome. In fact, uh, I was living in Wisconsin at the time, and Wisconsin's next door to Minnesota. So we had a, a good time laughing at our friends from Minnesota that they had elected a professional wrestler as their governor. Um, and a lot of the people who uh, who voted for the Democrat or the Republican, they probably, if they were to rank their candidates in order of preference, first, second, and third, they probably would have had uh, this media figure as their last choice. And so if we accept that argument, that means that Jesse Ventura won the, the election, became governor. He was governor of Minnesota, even though 63%, that's 100% minus the 37% that Ventura got. So that's 63% of voters really, really disliked the candidate who ended up winning. And so again, that gets labeled as unfair in some sense, even though, again, everybody got to vote, everybody's vote got counted. If we sort of accept that, then we still have this sense of unfairness where the outcome doesn't seem like it matched what the voters actually wanted. So this is what we're gonna be talking about for the next several sections. So in the next lecture, we're gonna start learning about some of the methods that we use to determine the winner of the election. And the most common method, what's most commonly used here in the United States, is called plurality voting, or sometimes called first past the post. And that's just one of the many less uh, methods that we're gonna learn about in this course.